Today we got the highly anticipated CPI report for December. And what's more significant, of course, is that it's the final month of the year. So now we have the results for the inflation rate for all of 2021. And the expectation was that for December, we would see an increase of 0.4. And we actually beat that slightly with an increase of 0.5. Although the anticipated year-over-year increase of 7.1, for some reason, we actually came out a little below that. 7.0 was the number. Still a 7 handle on the CPI for the year. This is the worst CPI officially in 39 years. You have to go back to 1982 to get a CPI that bad of course if we were still measuring inflation using the same cpi that we used in 1982 2021's inflation would have been higher than 1982 in fact it would have been the highest in history in fact if you simply substitute owner's equivalent rent for home prices because in 1982 home prices were what they were using for that component of the CPI. So if we substitute home prices for owner's equivalent rent, after all, nobody actually pays owner's equivalent rent. It's not like actual rent where you write a check to your landlord. Owner's equivalent rent is some made up number that some random people guess. And for some reason, they're always guessing low. I wonder why. But according to the government, Housing costs, as measured by owner's equivalent rent, were up 3.8% for the year. Meanwhile, actual home prices were up about 16.5% on the year. So if you take owner's equivalent rent out and put home prices in, you get 10% increase for the CPI in 2021. But of course, that's not the only dishonest part of the CPI because we now have hedonics and substitution and all sorts of gimmicks that are used to compute the CPI today that they didn't use back in 1982. So if we really compared apples to apples and used the same methodology that was used in 1982, we probably would have reported a 15% CPI increase for 2021, making it the worst CPI in history, meaning the highest. And in fact, even if you strip out food and energy, the CPI was still up 5.5% on the year. And of course, it would be up more if we weren't playing around with those numbers. That 5.5% core year-over-year increase is the highest since 1991. But probably what's most significant is if you look at goods prices as opposed to service prices, because goods prices alone were up 10.7% in 2021. Of course, they were up more than that if we didn't use the government's adjustments. But even after it was adjusted, in other words, rigged, the government still reported a 10.7% increase in goods prices. That's the biggest increase in one year since 1975. And one of the things that held that number down in December was the fact that energy prices were actually down. That has already been reversed. We've had a huge increase in energy prices. Look at oil prices. Today alone, oil up another buck and a half. We're over $82 a barrel, but oil has been very strong. In fact, I think we can hit a new 52-week high this week in oil. We can get over $85 a barrel, but everything is going up. All these commodities are going up. You know, copper was up 3% today. Across the board, we're seeing strength in commodity prices. All of this, of course, is going to be bleeding into the CPI all year. And so the numbers are only going to get worse. And even if you look at services, because a lot of people are trying to claim, well, it's all because of goods. Consumers are spending a lot more on goods, and that's why goods prices are up. They're not buying services. Well, services were still up 3.7%. That's the biggest increase in service prices since 2007. I mean, if no one is buying services, if we're just buying goods, why are the service prices going down? They're not. They're still going up at a faster pace than they've gone up since 2007. So it's not just goods. It's goods and services. 
Everything is getting more expensive. Everything is way above the Fed's so-called 2% target. The only thing that's not rising that much are wages. Real wages continue to fall. In fact, they've now been down for nine weeks in a row. Year over year, real wages declined by 2.4%. Of course, they actually declined by much more than 2.4% because the 2.4% is adjusting nominal wages by 7% inflation. But anybody who is earning wages is paying much higher price increases than 7%. Again, I said nobody is paying owner's equivalent rent. I mean, maybe the government should take food out and put eater's equivalent food. Maybe we should take energy out and put energy users equivalent energy. I mean, why just make up prices for anything? I mean, if we're going to use a phony price for home prices, why not use a phony price for food, a phony price for energy, a phony price for clothing, a phony price for everything, right? Just make the whole number up. Now, maybe that's exactly what the government is going to do. Over time, they're going to have to come up with all sorts of new gimmicks to try to make that number lower because there's no way they're going to make it lower honestly. So the only way to do it is to dishonestly report the number. But consumers are going to have to live in the real world, not in the government's fantasy world. And so real wages are going to continue to plunge, even as some politicians want to claim credit for the fact that the nominal wages are going up. But again, I've mentioned on the podcast, the real losers are not the wage earners. I mean, they lose, but they don't lose nearly as big as retirees who don't have any wages, who have some type of fixed incomes. And these fixed incomes are being eviscerated and it's going to be much worse, I think, in 2022 than it was in 2021. Now, one of the very interesting aspects of today's inflation report, which was slightly worse than expected, right? A little bit hotter on the December number, not necessarily the year over year number, but my guess is they're probably going to tweak that number up in January. And we're probably going to find out that the CPI was up more than 7% for 2021. But even if it's just 7%, that's still a big deal. That's still bad news. And one of the frustrating aspects of the markets during pretty much all of 2021 is that every time we reported a bad inflation number, which was pretty much every time we reported an inflation number, because they were all bad, they were all worse than expected, we had the perverse and frustrating counterintuitive reaction in the markets where the dollar went up and gold went down. And that would be very frustrating for my clients because they own foreign stocks, they own mining stocks, because of inflation. And now we're getting all the inflation that we anticipated, but instead of our inflation hedges going up, our inflation hedges were going down. Why? Again, I've explained it on the podcast. It's because investors were looking beyond the inflation numbers to the rate hikes that were going to follow and this successful battle that the Fed was going to wage against inflation. And it was the anticipation of this tighter monetary policy that was going to be triggered by these hot inflation numbers that was putting downward pressure on gold and upward pressure on the dollar. Well, today we got this 7% handle bad news on inflation. We get surging commodity prices that indicate that more upward pressure is going to continue in 2022. Yet instead of the dollar going up, it got clobbered. And the fact is the dollar was down big yesterday and then it was down even bigger today. In fact, we dropped better than one full percent on the dollar index. It actually traded above 96 two days ago. It closed right about 96. And today it closed below 95, 94 spot 32. It was down almost 70 basis points on the day after being down maybe 40 basis points yesterday. So it was a one-two punch for the US dollar. And what this indicates to me is investors are realizing that it doesn't matter if the Fed hikes rates because any rate hikes that we get are going to be too little too late to do anything to derail this inflationary freight train. And the reality is interest rates are historically negative. If inflation is 7% and interest rates are zero, 
we're at negative 7% interest rates. All the Fed is talking about doing is slowly raising interest rates to 2% over the next two years. Even if they do that, if inflation stays at 7%, you're going from negative 7% to negative 5%. That is not a positive environment for the US dollar. And investors are starting to realize that and they are dumping dollars. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn $500,000, million, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke. And you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where do you start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.